Hello, I'm Sterling Burnett, Senior Fellow and Managing Editor of Environment and Climate News. Thought, thought sorry for that uh, little snafu. I'm pleased to be here with you today for the third presentation in the Heartland Institute's 14th International Conference on Climate Change Lecture Series. I thank everyone out there who is joining us, and I hope many more will join us as the session goes on. Our 14th International Conference on Climate Change will be held in Las Vegas, Nevada at Caesars Palace, running from October 15th through 17th. The conference's timely theme is, quote, the Great Reset, Climate Realism versus Climate Socialism. We hope you will all attend, and I encourage you to get your tickets and make your arrangements now. Our previous conferences have brought together the best and brightest minds from around the world working on the science, economics, and policy issues surrounding climate change. This conference will explain the whys, wherefores, hows, and why nots about the state of climate science and climate policy. Be there or be uninformed. This lecture series presents brief previews of coming events at the of the conference's top speakers. Today, I'm pleased to have as a guest and a meteorologist, Anthony Watts. I've been honored to work with Anthony as a colleague at the Heartland Institute for about two years now, but Heartland worked with him, and I certainly used his work long before he joined us as a member of the staff. Anthony has long hosted the award-winning What's Up With That website, world's most viewed website on global warming and climate change. What's Up With That has often provided me leads for Climate Change Weekly stories to cover. Anthony is also the person most responsible for the surface stations project, which demonstrated that the majority of the temperature stations maintained by the Weather Service failed to meet their own standards for unbiased data. Anthony's presentation today is titled, Are We Really in a, quote, Climate Emergency? Not to give away the punchline, but I think you'll agree we aren't after hearing Anthony's presentation. Before Anthony's lecture begins, I want to say, if anyone has questions, please send them via the comments function on the program. We will have about five minutes to answer questions at the end of his talk. Anthony, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Sterling, <clears throat> and thank you, Heartland Institute, for hosting this. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, I've been following climate since about 2006, when Al Gore's movie first came out. And prior to that, I was a television meteorologist uh, all the way back to 1978. And I was very much a believer at the beginning of uh, the whole climate scare when it began in 1988, when Dr. James Hansen presented it to Congress. And he said, basically, we've got a problem. And the problem was outlined by his different scenarios, graphs, A, B, C. And I actually believe that we had a real problem there. And I became a climate activist back then. I was actually pushing to plant trees. I worked up a program with the National Arbor Day Foundation to have meteorologists promote planting trees to their viewers and worked up a program that went out to stations all over the United States in 1989 and 1990. But then I started learning about climate a little bit more and I met up with the former state climatologist of California, Jim Goodrich, who happened to retire in my town. And once he started showing me data associated with some of these weather stations in California and how they were placed and so forth, I began to question it. And ever since then, I realized that a good portion of climate science has been overhyped and oversold. And it's been a steady drumbeat of going from one point to another with trying to make people believe it. And they keep upping the ante. And now the latest one, of course, is climate emergency. That's the buzzword. They're talking climate emergency. Well, I'm going to show you some graphs and some data that suggest that the, the word emergency is, well, just another overblown upsell. So I'm going to start my presentation here. So are we really in a climate emergency? Well, we talked about that, and I'm skipping to the next slide. The Paris Climate Accord, Accord agreed to keep a warming level below 2 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels. That's what they're saying. That's the goal. And basically, at the current rate, we're going to get past that by the year 2026. So that's why they're declaring a climate emergency. We've got to really put the brakes on. Well, here's what it looks like in terms of temperature. You know, we've had a moderate uh, rise in temperature from 1880 to the present. And I want to point out that this is a highly magnified graph. It looks to people that are not paying attention to what's really being presented here, like the temperature is just soaring. But in fact, we're talking about a degree centigrade or more of temperature rise here that's highly exaggerated. If you put it on a regular scale, you, you know, you wouldn't even notice it. So 
we go back and look at some of the data, is we do we really have a climate emergency today? Well, look back around in the 1930s in the Dust Bowl period. Now, here's the number of summer record daily maximum set or tied from the United States Historical Climatological uh, Network. And you can see there's a huge spike of almost 8,000 daily maximum records set back in the 1930s compared to the present where we're hardly setting any records at all. Yet the drumbeat coming out of climate alarmism says, well, we're in the hottest period ever. Well, where are the records to support this? The fact is, there are none. The biggest, hottest period of time in the United States happened during the Dust Bowl period of the 1930s. And that was well before we had any issues whatsoever with carbon monoxide. In fact, or carbon dioxide, pardon me there. Carbon dioxide was well below what was considered to be the safe level of 350 parts per million. So here's the number of all time station records. Even that had a big spike way back in the 30s. So here's part of the reason why people think we're in a climate emergency. Now, this is an animation showing two different data sets from different time periods from the same organization. NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Study is a keeper of the data. In fact, they're the folks that started this whole thing back in 1988 with Dr. James Hansen. Well, in 1998, you can see these two points that are circled. Watch them shift. What happens is they've cooled the past in the 30s and warmed up the present around 2000. That's all a statistical manipulation. And they don't deny it, but very few people in the media ever bother to look at this and question it. They just think that, well, you know, the temperature is the temperature, but they don't go back and look at the historical changes that have been made to it. All of these changes have been statistical manipulations, or as they call them, adjustments. And they try to justify these adjustments by making peer-reviewed papers saying, well, so-and-so needs to be processed and this and that needs to be adjusted and so forth and so on. The result is, is that in, without exception, the past tends to get cooler and the present tends to get warmer. So they say in their draft declaration, the fourth annual national climate assessment back in 2018 warns that extreme weather and climate related events in the United States are worsening. This report also predicts increased drought cycles, heat waves in the Western US, and a threefold increase in intensity and magnitude of wildfires and gas, unless the greenhouse gas emissions are curbed. So let's look at drought in California. Now, you may remember a few years ago, the Governor Jerry Brown says, this is the new normal. We're in a permanent drought mode. A permanent drought has taken hold in California. And there was lots of wailing and gnashing of teeth over that. But then back on January 7th of 2020, drought disappeared. Well, how can that happen if, you know, we're really being driven by climate? That's a real question. And the, pro and, and the issue is, is that Everything is cyclical, everything. And if you look at drought over uh, history, and this is from a study, Cook et al., North American Drought Reconstruction, Causes and Consequences. They went in and looked at tree rings all over the Western United States and came up with a, uh, a graph of wet and dry, basically real simple, wetter periods and drier periods. And what they discovered is that back in medieval times, there were mega droughts, two of them, big ones, 200 years long. And then, you know, we had one around 1850 when California became a state. And then it was just a small one in comparison. And then since then, we've enjoyed wetter periods of climate in California. And then all of a sudden we went through another drought and boom, that little point at the end, that's the one they say is caused by man-made climate change. Ignore that all, all that other stuff. That was just all natural. Well, it's not very convincing when you look at the data. So they say extreme weather and climate related in the United States, climate related events in the United States are worsening. Well, there really isn't something called a climate related event. An event is weather. Climate related is debatable. They, they like to apply, you know, climate driven weather events, but there's really no connection. And even the IPCC says this. And here's another thing that just was really inconvenient. Back in 2018, the tornado count in the United States tanked. 
it went down to its lowest ever. It just completely disappeared. It fell off the scale. And even the Washington Post covered it, saying it's the first year with no violent tornadoes in the United States. Yet in that same year, we've had people saying, you know, the climate is worsening. It's causing more severe weather. You know, we're in the hottest period ever, so forth and so on. But nature just was not cooperating. Then there's hurricanes. Well, Hurricanes are worsening, according to Al Gore, back around uh, 2006 when he put out his movie An Inconvenient Truth and uh, Hurricane Katrina had hit in 2005. He declared that major hurricanes like this to be the new normal. Well, then nature says, you know what, Al, I'm just going to, we'll see about that. And so an 11.8 year period went by where there were no major category three, four or five landfalls of hurricanes in the United States. That never happened before in our entire record. When a tremendous period of time without having major hurricanes. But at the same time, people are saying hurricanes are getting worse. Hurricanes are getting more frequent. But the data doesn't support it. So they say a resulting threefold increase in intensity and magnitude of wildfires unless greenhouse gas emissions are curbed. So here's some wildfire in California in the western United States. Now, this graph here um, is somewhat controversial. In fact, it's so controversial that the, the National Interagency Fire Center, which published this data that make up this graph, disappeared it just last month. They disappeared all the data prior to 1983. And of course, that gets rid of that big spike of data that you see there back around 1926 through about 1934 and so forth. And so by eliminating that data, by hiding it, then all you see is this very slight increase that happened you know, from 1983 onward. And then they claim that that is driven by climate change. They completely disappeared it from their website. And you can go to climaterealism.com, uh, one of Heartland's websites, and find all the details about that, including the entire data record, and judge for yourself. But here's the thing. If climate change was such a certainty, so real, why would they have to disappear data? And that's one of the problems associated with climate science. They don't play fair with data and they don't play fair with the way that they present it. So they say in their draft declaration, severe rainfall in February, 2017 across Northern and Central California resulted in five deaths and 1.5 billion in damage, including the Oroville Dam spillway, causing a multi-day evacuation of 188,000 residents. But wait, how can we have, you know, droughts are getting worse and rainfall is getting worse and both of these being caused by climate because we're in a climate emergency? Well, it just goes back to it's just weather. And, and here's the weather analysis, something called an atmospheric river. And I, I've known about this as long as I've been in California. Atmospheric rivers are the major drivers of precipitation in California for both the snowpack as well as liquid precipitation that falls on California. And we happen to have a huge atmospheric river event that happened during that time. It dumped a tremendous amount of rain on an already nearly full reservoir. It was a weather event and it was not driven by climate. People call it the Pineapple Express and it happens every year in this wintertime with regularity. This past year, we haven't had it so much. So now we're back in a drop situation in California because we have, you know, have had less precipitation. But of course, they're blaming that on climate change too. But here's the rub. If you go back and look at historical data, all the way back to 1862. Now, this is the picture of downtown Sacramento following the Great Flood of 1862. This is Old Town Sacramento, which is still preserved and you can still walk through the boardwalks on these buildings today. They were underwater because they had an atmospheric river event from December 1861 to mid-January 1862. And CO2 levels back then were like 250 parts per million. So if climate change is making severe rainfall events worse in California and the West, but way back then it was happening when CO2 levels were so low, how can that be? How can we be in a climate emergency? Well, it's easy if you don't pay attention to the past. It's also easy if you project into the future. Here's another example. You know, they're always talking about sea level rise and they make up, you know, pictures and, and 3D animations to say, oh, look what it's going to look like in so many years ahead. Here's one that the History Channel did in 2010. This is the battery in New York City. Um, and this is how they projected 
it to look, right? This is what's going to happen because of climate change. Well, here's the tide gauge from the battery in New York, and you can see it's been rising steadily and without acceleration all the way back to 1856 when they first started making measurements. Well, here's the thing you can do. You can call them on this by doing some simple math, and that's what I did. I measured how far up did the water go in their simulation, and I found it was about 18 stories. So if you do some simple math, it would take 26,000 years to get that level. Yes, of course, these folks are saying this is, you know, 50 to 100 years in the future. It's an outright lie. It's a fabrication. Here's the other thing. The city of New York has dealt with sea level rise for a long time. This is 1660. And I'm going to show you this animation here. This is what the the battery area looked like in, in, in 1660. Now, if I animate it, you'll see, hopefully, there it's growing. So basically, what's happened over a period of time is they added to and got, you know, fill put in and so forth, and they kept making it uh, bigger. They've dealt with the climate change driven sea level rise, that claim of it anyway. But, you know, back then, climate change wasn't even a, a word. But they've been dealing with sea level rise just fine and having no trouble with it just simply by keeping up with their infrastructure. So can we get there, even though we're being asked to declare a climate emergency? Can we keep that temperature down by doing things like taxing carbon or putting more taxes on gasoline or natural gas or whatever it might be, taxing fossil fuels all over the planet and switching to wind and solar power. Well, that's the belief system, but can we get there? Really, it's pretty unlikely. This graph shows what we'd need to do to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade target. The black line is CO2 emission increases over the last 118 years. So if we wanted to get down to the target, that they're talking about. We have to take this precipitous plunge in reduction of emissions. And I will point out that during the COVID uh, closure of the world last year, when we had significant reductions in CO2 emissions because of the fact that industry shut down, travel shut down, just pretty much everything shut down, there was no negligible measured decrease in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It pretty much went on as business as usual, which points to the idea that, well, maybe a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, natural variation and not really man-made kinds of climate changes and so forth because of CO2. So that's a, a preview of my presentation. I'll have a lot more when we actually have the conference in Las Vegas coming up in October. Well, thanks, Anthony. Uh, so one of the questions, uh, I'm not sure if James is going to put it up or not, but the first question that came in is an interesting one is, is NOAA doing anything to fix the surface station problems you've identified? Well, actually, no. <laughs> Again, it, it's like, let's sweep it under you the mean government. You mean there's a problem and government hasn't been able to fix it in 20 years? Imagine that. No, well, they've done worse than that. The Surface Station Project focused on the U.S. Historical Climatological Network, and this was an, a subset of all the weather stations in the United States that they deemed the best, the most accurate, right? This was about 1,200 stations. So instead of going out and fixing those best stations where we identified that almost 90% of them had some kind of problem associated to being next to air conditioners or in the middle of parking lots or whatever. I mean, really crazy examples of, of bad scientific measurements where the, 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 the place where they're measuring the temperature has been corrupted. Instead of fixing those or removing them, what they did is they simply removed the network they stopped updating the network. Well, we're not going to do it that way anymore. We'll do it this way. And they came up with something called climate divisions. So it's a big statistical mishmash that they created so that they didn't have to basically deal with the criticisms that we had brought out on the U.S. climate network, the historical climate network. So they just swept it into the rug. Um, but they did set up something called... Um, the, the, the surface, 
what was what, they they set up a project with about there is another network. Yeah, the the the, the second network, it, and it is has high quality stations, and it shows no temperature, no significant temperature rise. Correct. Well, there is another network called the Climate Reference Network that they right. started putting together in 19, in 2000. Uh, it was originally conceived around 99, 2000, and then it was started to be built around 2002. And then it started to become viable in 2005 when they had enough stations. And these, this particular network is state-of-the-art, triple redundancy, temperature sensors, automatic correction, failovers, all this kind of, uh, you know, ISO 9000 kind of stuff that's built into it to make sure it's accurate. And I've examined these stations and they are away from, you know, human influence. You know, there's no parking lots nearby. There's no air conditioners nearby, anything like that. So I respect the data that's coming out of this network. The problem is, is that just like they did with the U.S. Historical Climatological Network, they take the data and sweep it under the rug. You will never, ever see an, a report coming out on the monthly climate summary or the yearly climate summary done by NOAA that shows the data from this network. They never show it, ever. Even though the data does not show the alarming rate of warming that you see elsewhere. Well, no, it, it, it's not even though it's because it doesn't show the alarming rate of warming that they don't, that they don't show it. Now, we have a gentleman, uh, I believe he's from England, Guff Pot is what he goes by. And it's, he says, they declared England in permanent drought around 2011. It was the new normal. We've heard a lot about the new normal recently. Uh, aquifers would take decades to fill. Then it rained hard and the aquifers are full and we don't talk about it anymore. That's pretty common over here in the United States as well, isn't it? Yeah, and it happened. It's the same thing in Australia. Flannery down in Australia. They call him Flim Flam Flannery because it seems like every prediction out of his mouth got squished by nature, just like they, nature does to Al Gore. He said the same thing. We're in a permanent drought. You know, our reservoirs are not going to fill up. We're in big trouble. Well, then there was rains and floods and, you know, and these people get regularly made to look like idiots by nature. And then they just don't talk about it anymore because, well, you know, that was embarrassing. Well, Anthony, uh, I want to thank you for being on today, uh, for participating oh, wait, with us. We've got week. another one here. We've got another question. Oh, okay. So he's asking, if we design a network, what's the first thing we need to do to address how to sample the climate? And if we're careless with sampling, surely the measurement will be biased. Well, that's true. If you're, It's just like any scientific measurement. If you allow the, you know, the in vitro, you know, area where you're doing the measurement to be corrupted, then it's going to corrupt the record. And the answer is the best thing we've got is the U.S. Climate Reference Network. Unfortunately, that has not been extended to around the world. And even though we have a good state-of-the-art system here in the United States that's reporting good climate data, we've only got about 20 years of data from it, and it's not been repeated elsewhere in the, in the world, and it doesn't get brought into the world's record. So as a result, um, it basically left us high and dry without any really good climate data. The next best climate data that I can point to <clears throat> is the satellite data coming from the University of Alabama Huntsville by Dr. Roy Spencer and Dr. John Christie. Now, like any measurement system, it has its own set of problems. There were They were talking about satellite drift early on and some other things that might have affected it, but they went and corrected that. And their data shows a significantly less rate of warming than the surface temperature record, which has been corrupted and biased. Yes, it's gotten warmer over the last century, but is it a crisis? Is it an emergency? No, we're dealing with it. Everything's doing just fine. Crop yields are up, productivity is up, our health is up. Everything about the human condition is up during this moderate warming over the last century. And yet people are telling us on a daily basis, we're in a climate emergency. We have to stop doing what we're doing. But in fact, the human race is damn successful at what they're doing and everybody's thriving. So what's the problem? Well, that's a great point to end on, Anthony. Uh, I want to thank you for participating, everyone, for participating in today's event and everyone in the audience for joining us. Before you go, I want to let you know the event and every other presentation we do in this series will remain available on Heartland's website for anyone who wants to review and share them with friends who are unable to attend. In addition, 
Please be on the lookout for notice of the next presentation of our climate change series. Also, before signing off, I want to take the opportunity to encourage you once again to attend the 14th International Conference on Climate Change in person in Las Vegas in October and go to Heartland's website and to the Heartland Daily News website for the latest in environment and energy and climate news. And finally, please support the Heartland Institute year round. You can contact anyone and they'll put you in contact with David Hoyt, Heartland's brilliant executive in charge of development, director of development, to tell you how you can help us be more success, successful in our mission to spread the, the good news about free markets around the world. Thanks. Take care. Bye.